Well, um, joined today um, by Stuart Carroll, who's an infectious disease specialist who's currently seconded on COVID-19 um, um, projects in terms of the vaccination programme, also a key mental health advocate. And also joining me today is Carl Robinson, who is um, current manager at Oxford United Football Club. And we're going to be chatting about mental health, football, vaccines, COVID programmes and life post-COVID when we're all allowed out again. OK, so, Carl, do you want to kind of introduce yourself, um, talk a little bit about football and then we're just pretty much going to have a, a kind of free flowing conversation, really, because um, I know you two are both. Well, I know Stuart's a huge Tune fan, so um, yeah, we'll see. How we, we can see that. Clearly, what you're talking about half the time. <laughs> legend that is Alan Shearer deliberately behind. I'm, I'm currently sat in the uh, affectionately uh, named Alan Shearer dining room, and as I was explaining <laughs> to Carl just a few moments ago, I actually named this with my little nephews. Sent a tweet out to the legend that is, and he retweeted it with a with a nice quote. So if you're watching, Alan, thanks for that. Um, and you'll also see um, my cat Winston constantly appearing he's also black and white like the tune he never ever takes his top off so that's how uh, <clears throat> important the tune is to, to this household uh, I, i'm doing mine sheila from uh, my wife's living room <laughs> but Alan Shearer, um, no I, I think i think it's important here that we that we, we we talk through these points and that we're between me and Stuart, we've been speaking before you started recording this about the importance of of mental health and the importance of being able if one person be affected by this conversation it, it's a positive conversation to be had and i think sometimes not enough people have the have the platform to do what we're doing today to affect just that one individual person and we don't and I, she, we talk quite a lot about for all the conversations that we have mm. we don't know who this may affect and there's no there's, no there's no government rollout um graph to say this conversation saved a hundred people's lives, one person's life. We only ever have data on things that are actual factual that actually happen. Mm. And this is the thing, some people can't put an actual limit on these conversations, but we all know from the experience that we've all had between the three of us here, that these small conversations play a big key role in opening up doors and opening up conversations in other people's Alan Shearer living rooms or whatever living rooms people yeah. sit in. Um, yeah. Hopefully to, you never, we're never, ever, ever, because our brains are so, so intelligent and so beautifully different, and they're always going to be in having a good day or a bad day. We're never ever going to get rid of you, you, your job is to try and get us out of this pandemic of COVID nineteen and so many different variants that may come along. Well, no vaccination will ever cure mental health. It's about having an ability to talk about it so people understand it. That's really interesting with that, that sentence you just said there, because we do it and you did that without realising. Nothing will ever cure mental health. Mental health doesn't need curing, it's mental ill health. And we all do it. So it doesn't matter how conscious we are of mental health, consciously or subconsciously, at some point, we'll revert to thinking of it in the way our brains are ingrained with thinking. You know, it's like we were talking the other day, weren't we, Carl, about the language of mental health as well. Yeah. Sometimes you'll, you know you'll get into trouble for using a certain word because you used it in your childhood and you use it in a context. It slips out and you think, oh, that wasn't... Yeah, I got, I got in trouble, Stuart, for, for saying... Um... Well, you'll know this as a football fan. Could you imagine um, on a Friday afternoon someone saying your, gate, your kick-off for Newcastle's being moved from 3 o'clock on Saturday to 3 o'clock on Sunday? It doesn't happen. Anyway, it did. Um, we, we turn up to the game at three o'clock on the Sunday. It gets moved to 4.30 on the Sunday. Um, through weather conditions, <clears throat> we kick off at 4.30 now on a Sunday. We're playing live on Sky at six o'clock on the Tuesday. So obviously our recovery time is getting reduced. And at half time, the fire alarm goes and I'm in the car park speaking to the fire brigade for an hour at half time. Bumped into the, the, the people who... And because our stadium's a vaccination centre... So yeah. we had to get everybody out, and obviously the fear then for the vaccinate for the vaccinations that were in the building and the game going on and so on and so forth. I walked back into the building with the fire brigade to check everything's okay. Can we come back in and speak to the referee? And we kick off an hour and fifteen minutes later. Um, we thankfully win two one, 
And I just said, the last 40 hours have been completely mental. I, crazy. And it was almost like people said, well, you can't use that word. I went, well, I, I understood the context in which I was told that I can't use it. But growing up as a kid, the word mental was something that's a normal word, yeah. A normal word. And now because it's stigma with mental health, people put the mental as crazy and all over the place in that bracket. And it was mm. it's almost like I don't know how we change it. I don't know whether we will ever change it. But even if you, yeah. you use the word actually, mental ill health or mental good health, mm. like it's still mental still at the beginning of all of these sentences. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one of the massive things is, uh, and we were discussing it just before we were recording earlier, is um, how important it is for uh, people to uh, value and appreciate the um, importance of sport, actually. You know, uh, sport is such a big, big thing to people's mental health. It's a big thing to us as a, as a country, to the world, you know, particularly football. And I think one of the really invaluable things, and I think it's fantastic to have someone like yourself, you know, who's a you know, prominent football manager talking about this because, you know, the, the footballing community is a really captive audience. Um, so the more we can actually get people within these, these kind of sports, particularly football, which is the national game, talking about mental health, the better because we know, particularly, you know, younger kids, but, you know, look at me, you know, I'm, I'm in my 30s and I'm, I'm naming dining rooms after Alan Shearer, you know, I'm, I've, got, I've got a cat who's black and white, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it goes to show how, how um, impressionable we are and how we, you know, we look to certain role models and I think football is, is totally unique. I mean, probably you and I get that more than a lot of people, so I think particularly in the north of the country, you know, coming from Newcastle, um, obviously Liverpool, it, it, it does have a particular attachment as a particular um, emphasis. It, it's more than actually just a football club. It's actually quite a community-based thing. It's a society-based thing. And I think when you can leverage that to your advantage to say, actually, you know, we're all in this together, um, just like your football club, you know, it doesn't matter whether you win, lose, draw, you support the team. Mental health is similar. Like, you know, we're all, we should all be there to support one another, you know, and um, I think, I think footballers, um, also a really good example because, uh, you know, the, 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 some of the stereotyping typecasting around football is, um, is, is, is pretty, pretty poor. You know, frankly, it's, it's pretty rancid if, we, if we're being honest about it in the media. Mm. And you've got to take, uh, you know, football as, as a good example of some of the pressures and stresses and strains they're having to deal with. And I think social media is a prominent example of that. You know, I'm campaigning at the moment with um, a couple of... Uh, MPs to really get social media providers to do uh, a hell of a lot more on internet providers. You know, some of the abuse that you see on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram uh, towards footballers is just totally unacceptable. And, and that, that's affecting mental health. You know, these people are human beings. It doesn't matter how tough you are. Um, it, it, it's just the way it is. So I think sport actually, not just because of its benefits of physical health, which we know is good for mental health, but also from a platform point of view is, is, is so, so important. Um, and I think it's great. I think it's great to have, you know, someone like yourself who is talking about it within a, um, you know, a football club, but also I, I, I also think like you, like you were just sort of touching upon there, uh, you know, language and stuff. I mean, a lot of people would probably think, well, they might be watching this now going, all right, well, we would sort of expect Sheila to be talking about it, but you got, you got, you know, a guy from Newcastle originally, you got a guy from Liverpool, what are they doing talking about it? And I think it's sort of breaking that barrier down as well. Um, it's critical. Sport was always, to be from Liverpool, like, it, it, it almost categorised you in, in a way in, in, your early, in your early years because you were red or blue. It wasn't about your skin colour, it wasn't about your mental health thoughts, it wasn't about anything, it was, are you red or blue? All right, if you're red, they're your mates. If you're blue, <laughs> they're your mates. Blue, uh, a bit probably, you've got your your arch rivals. I know it's a bit different because you're almost like a one a one club city, but you had a, a real um, draw towards Newcastle as one city. Um, yeah. And your rivalry came from a city just slightly south of you. But I think the tribal aspect of the industry, um, 
in the in the seventies and eighties and and going through into the nineties, it's it's sort of tailed off a little bit because of the the finances within our our game has become such a global sport, uh, and the Premier League being the leading the leading league in the world that. When you're speaking about mental health within the Premier League, you do reach every corner of the globe. And yeah. there's, I always say myself, Pepsi and Coca Cola might, might be able to do that. Um, there's very few institutions that have that capability to affect people's thought processes and to affect mm-hmm. change for the good. Now, people don't like football people because they think they're overpaid, they're egotistical, but these are young people who have gone from school kicking a football around on the playground with the mates, which we all did, or playing games. in the, And all of a sudden, they do the GCSEs. At 16, they start playing football at a professional football club. And all of a sudden, at 18, 19, they're playing in front of thousands of people. At what stage of that do they have to grow up? <laughs> it, 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 it's every young person's dream to, to still be, play, to be playing football and have that ability to do it. And that's why football is such an easy target. But I think... And I'm seeing this for the better in our dressing room, how we how we speak to each other. Like I've got a I've got a player who's 30, um, really interested when the Black Lives Matter movement first started. He was really interested in the psychology of it and the effect it had on. on and he asked some of our black players, "Have you ever been racially abused? How did that affect you?" And they hadn't been, but their parents had. And how did that affect you growing up? So. These are conversations that are starting to appear in dressing rooms and the vocabulary and the way they converse is starting to change because we're so engrossed in in what our industry is trying to, to change. I mean, you know, you know, the prostate cancer, uh, the mind campaign, they've been the two leading sponsorships for the for the EFL for the past, I think, eight years now. I think they just signed another contract. So the, the two of the two really close organisations to the EFL have become really key talking points within our industry. And I just hope that... I've got a very close friend of mine who is an ex-professional footballer. Um, obviously, I won't use his name, but he he put something on the, on the WhatsApp the other day and it, was, it wasn't right. It, it wasn't something that you would foresee. And it's, this player played at a top, top level. And uh, about how he's struggling with this and struggling with that, he's lost his mum, and, and it's amazing how many people jump right on. Say, "I make you a call. I'm here if you need me." And 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 how the positivity of, towards him was different to probably what it would have been ten years ago. And I think I think that it's starting to do and, and Sheila, we know there's starting to be a shift of change in communication skills. And if yeah. the pandemic is going to teach us anything, is that we can do things like this. We don't have to have that meeting in London or Milton Keynes or Liverpool or Newcastle, we can just jump on this call and see people face to face. I know you, you, you say the 30 minute zoom face Sheila, but even if it is, it is only for 30 minutes, we have this now capability to converse in a much better and a more engaging way. Yeah. I think, I think it's so important. I mean, it's so, so important. I mean, I, I would say as well, because I feel very strongly about this, that, what you touched upon there, Carl, you know, you're right, you know, a lot of footballers, they come in as basically children, teenagers into men very, very quickly. And indeed, we're seeing it in the women's game as well now, you know, um, you know, young girls going into uh, their teenagers, then becoming stars. And yes, of course, we want our footballers to be role models and to be responsible people, absolutely. But it's important we also give them the broader training and education to be able to cope and deal with all this fame and all this um, fortune and all this um, acclaim they get, and particularly in the world of social media. And I actually think uh, what we need to be doing is not you know, constantly sort of hammering footballers, but actually uh, supporting the overwhelming majority, which are decent people, um, you know, providing a fantastic product, which we all enjoy, which is a huge part of our own mental health because we all love watching football. We all love supporting our teams. And, you know, as for the, the money side of things, you know, I've always said, you know, you can't really blame a footballer for just taking their slice of the cake. You know, at the end of the day, the industry is the industry um, and they are the main stars on the pitch. Um, how much footballers should pay in tax is a different question, but you can't blame a footballer for earning what they earn you know I think that's just a completely false and pointless discussion they're just taking what they take you wouldn't say to a musician you wouldn't say to 
I don't know, Noel Gallagher, well, you know, you can only earn so much from the records you sell. Well, that's down to the public to decide how much he earns because it's down to how many records they buy, whether they like his songs or not. You know, somebody likes a footballer and they think they're great, then that's down to individuals to decide. But I actually think we should be harnessing footballers and football as a great example of um, how you can achieve, how you can be part of a really competitive industry, how you can be a leader, but you can also talk about mental health. Uh, we were just talking a, you know, a few moments ago, I think Gareth Southgate's been fantastic as England manager, you know, in, in more ways than one. I think he's doing, doing a good job, but you know, he's brought mental health to the fore, talking about it and working through it with players and talking about fears, even taking penalties and all that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, that is, that, is the, that is the right sort of leadership we need. And I think the more people in football talk about it, because of its global reach, like you say, we hit, you know, every corner of the globe with our Premier League. And even the EFL, you know, gets uh, broadcasted everywhere. Uh, the, the more we're going to get our message over, but it's, it's okay. It's okay not to be okay. It's all right to talk about it. And actually the brave, positive thing to do is talk about it. You know? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we we did a we've been running sessions for the last three weeks, haven't we, Carl? With senior leaders um, in the um, in in a department for Deloitte, and you know just getting that um, crossover of you know leadership in a high pressure environment, i.e., Carl's role in football and leadership in organisations and in corporate entities where there's high pressure at the top at the top end. There's so many synergies there, and football can overarch so much in terms of leading by example, but also kind of getting across these, you know, where there's a lot of crossover in terms of industry and the business and in terms of leadership and resilience, because at the end of the day, it all comes from just being human beings, isn't it? And we all want to follow great leaders. We all want leaders that are compassionate um, so that we can aspire and, 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 and do the right things. And football, um, I mean, I'm not a big football fan. I know nothing about football. I've never got the offside rule, even when they explained it in the context of shoes and all of that. I've never got it. But for me... I'm not sure if VAR's got it, to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> You know, for me, what I see as a non-football person looking in is that, you know, you've got these tens of thousands of blokes singing, hugging, crying. You know, you see emotion in men on football terraces that you would never see anywhere else. So for me, as an outsider looking in, that, that seems like it's a very, it's like a release for them of, of, of emotion and, do, you know, it's like, how are those fans, how are those people coping now without having that release? You know, I think for me, I would say if I had to hazard a guess, that's where a lot of men get their kind of mental health kind of steamer, you know, to, like letting the steam out and, and, and getting, you know, vocal and, and, and letting it all out. So over COVID, I can imagine that a lot of those people have struggled hugely with where to kind of put that. I've just been watching, um, <clears throat> I started watching a day, got late on, at the end of a storm, it's called, it's Liverpool winning the league last year, but it, it goes back over the last 30 years. And I never realised, you know, they, 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 they drift from, I think there's a pub in New Zealand that opens up a quarter four in the morning for games. There's a family in, in the United States of America who, who sit down at 8.30 to watch it and of a night. And it's, it's, it's really, really, it shows you the global, re I'm just using one football club for an example, mm -hmm. but the passion of people walking to the ground and there's a guy who walks through, and again, it's just when you see little things on TV, it just resonates with you. The fella said the greatest thing he can ever dream of doing is holding his son's hand and walking him into the cop for the Liverpool game. <clears throat> so there's, there's no better feeling for a father to be walking in with your son to support your team. Now, mm. that, that was a passing comment, right? Where's that person getting his release from? Where's he getting that social interaction with his son? Mm. They're, they're the moments that... I remember I remember two things. I remember my dad at seven years of age when we, when we won the league in 80, 86. In 86, I would have been six then. And 
and little Liverpool school. I used to stand on the seat because obviously I was only small. I was once small, Sheila. And <laughs> um, my dad just picking me up and throwing me and, and hugging me. I remember in 89 when Michael Thomas scored that last minute goal, me literally in tears on my seat saying, want to go, dad? And he went to me, no, you're staying. You're clapping them Sunday, won the league. And these are moments within a, 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 with a, with a son or daughter, with the parents. These are special oh, places. I'm not, I'm not saying the places of worship or the places of this or that, but they are to some people. Just because it's not like anybody else's religion, it, it, it is to some people. And that might sound ridiculous. We, we, did, a, we did a campaign. It was meant to go over the... Well, the 17th of March last year, Sheila, wasn't it? It was meant to be bringing yeah. your whole self to work with MHFA England. And um, we did a podcast around um, bringing your whole self. And what it meant by that was you basically being you and not going in with your with your shield of work and, and the, the protecting yourself and having that capability of being you in the workplace. Because you all know, I'm sure in your industry, Stuart, it's very, very similar we all have a, a default. We all have a self-defense mechanism because the fear of the, the debate actually internally getting into you and them seeing that is, is in the workplace a sign of, a sign of weakness when it's actually not. Like we, we were speaking to Deloitte the other day, like the humility and the empathy and sometimes that sense of fear that you can show to somebody is a real endearing quality in a human being. Mm. Yeah. That vulnerable. Well, I think. I think. I think the thing is, Carl. Like, you know, I, like I say to everyone, um, everybody has mental health. You know, just like everybody has physical health. You can look at a footballer training, and you know, there may be a footballer who has, um, you know, has pre- previously had a cruciate knee ligament injury. So you know, they've got a, a physical frailty. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're any different to the rest of the team in the sense they have broader physical health. It's the same with mental health. You may have a player who has a clinically diagnosed mental health condition, but everybody has mental health and you can either have good mental health or bad mental health. Mm. And if you've got bad mental health, you ain't going to perform to the level that you want to perform. You want people going out feeling confident, uh, they have the belief and when things are going tough, they have the resilience and resolve to pull through and to stick together, so on and so forth. So, you know, for me, mental health, we also have to get the message out. It isn't just the one in three, one in four, it's the one in one, it's all of us. Yeah. And therefore, actually, if you take particularly, and this is why I think sports very unique. I think you know football is unique, and I remember the football teams I played in. There's something very sacrosanct about the dressing room. You know, it's kind of, I think particularly for men, but you know, I think it's true of women as well. But you know, it's a sort of, um, it's a strange place. It can either be a really positive place, or it can be quite a sort of negative place. It sort of tends to go from one to the other. And when it's great, it's like, it's like, wow, you know, like I don't want to be anywhere else. This is just amazing. When it's bad, it's like, oh, you know, it's just a terrible sort of thing. And of course, therefore, having people who who can help one another and support one another, but 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 get one another and understand one another, I think, is so so important. You know, it's so vital. And I think um, what you just talked about before. I mean, you know. For, Football is is to it is like a religion to people, and I think we should all be uh, very positive about that. You know, uh, what at the end of the day, human beings um, want to be understood. You know, we all want identity, and of course, football teams, football clubs provide us a sort of identity. Um, you know, I remember the first time I went to St James's Park. You know, it's kind of like uh, imprinted on your on your brain. You know, and um, it's the same like. Uh, you take Newcastle United, I mean, it's not rational to support Newcastle United. Let's just be clear about that. We ain't won anything since 1967. We are rubbish, sadly. That's just the way it is. But there's no way I'm changing my team. You know, just the, the, lots of things could change in my life, but that's one thing that will never, ever change because it's part of who you are. You know, my late grandfather, his grandfather, so on and so forth, all the way down. And in those moments even though we haven't won anything, you know, which is desperately sad and I hope we do in my lifetime, but you never know. Mike, please sell the club. But, uh, but you know, it's, um, it's sort of like, a, it's sort of basically, uh, you, you stick by the team, you know, you've you, you, you got to do it because it, it's part of who you are and it's part of what you're all about. And, you know, you see like Newcastle fans, like we were talking about earlier, travelling miles and miles, you know, midweek to go and support the team. Well, that's actually also, even when we lose, bizarrely enough, good for their mental health because it's um, part of who they are. It's, it's a release for them. It's an identity. It's a camaraderie. 
uh, Public Health England, World Health Organization, we are all the statistics, you know, I could do a sort of, you know, Jamie Carragher, Gary Neville, Sky Sports, uh, perfect analysis on this, but, you know, we'll leave that to those lads to, to keep doing on Monday Night Football. But the reality is all the, all the uh, evidence shows that um, football clubs, um, sports, even things like pubs, local pubs, are vital to stop isolationism, and loneliness. Um, and isolationism, and loneliness is a, is a big immediate precursor to bad mental health or, sadly, in some cases, people getting mentally ill with clinically diagnosed conditions. So I, I feel like the power of football is huge. You know, I'm not just saying that as some biased football fan. I think it's absolutely massive. And um, I think we should be leveraging football a lot more I, I would like to see the FA in the Premier League be even more ambitious I think it's great we've got people like Carl who are frankly like way above and beyond most football managers and most football clubs that's not to say others aren't doing great things but I'll give you an example right of some some where I think like mental health kind of can be linked to just what you call good man management so I was reading recently um, as, a, as a as a Toon fan trying to look back at the the, the good the good days recently and Rafa Benitez was talking about um, uh, how he, how he sort of was, ma- how he, how his time in Newcastle, how he managed. And the first thing to say is anybody who makes Paul Dummett a Premier League player is a magician. That's the first thing to say. No, no offence, Paul, but we all know you're a Championship player. But um, he thought specifically about uh, Paul I'm Dummett. Just in case I end up signing him later on in my career, so <laughs> he's a good lad. I'll give him that. He's a good lad. But uh, but the point I'm making is facetious to one side. Paul Dummy was great for us at left back under Benitez. You know, solid, one of our best players. And he talks about those kind of players, but what he did with them, which was he kind of understood they had a certain ability level. But one of the big things was to get into their minds. You know, to try and make them believe a bit more, make them feel more confident, more comfortable playing with maybe players that are better than them. And you don't need Maslow or Herzberg or all these so-called geniuses to work out that that's about motivation. You know, it's about man management. Um, I always say to people, if you want to learn anything about man management, read Sir Bobby Robson's autobiography. It is fantastic. You know, I mean, anybody who could manage Paul Gascoigne, say no more, you know. But on that point alone, I would say this, you know, isn't Paul Gascoigne a great example Um of how we all should have done better with mental health. You know, Paul Gascoigne, an absolute genius of a, of a footballer. I think probably the best footballer we've ever produced. Um, that, that, uh, and that, that, sorry, sorry, that, that goes back, though, mate, to uh, with success becomes... I was saying to you before, we go from the school playground to on the, a young player to become a professional footballer to the gaining success and then the commercial world wanting the PC here. Absolutely, and then, and then and then you're driven to advertisements to, to speaking on on Terry Wogan when that that was the era and speaking on Parkinson and doing all these things and and the social aspect of their life, and then the no control in that in, in that era of where people could say no, you're a football person, and there was no education within the industry. I don't think back then, and by the way, not everybody needed the education, but certain members of the institution did need it because it, it, it's clearly evident. And it, I think the percentage is over seventy percent of professional footballers get divorced from that that era when they retire within within ten years of retiring. Yeah, so absolutely, there, there, there wasn't in in the last twenty years of our game enough support aftercare support for what happens when they finish playing football. Because we speak about the finances that they gain, and you're talking about Paul Gascoigne. It would have been phenomenal for like going to Lazio and coming back to England. It would have been so high as financial levels he was hitting but where was the support where was somebody there to, to guide him in a way because back then if you're an agent it was about making money it wasn't about can I invest this into into this can I get you into this to see somebody and we I think what's becoming more and more prominent within our game and I'm sure that like the Bobby Robsons of this world they were probably the best psychologists we would have ever had today definitely and, definitely and, the guy that I used to work with who sadly passed away, Simon Edwards, he was brilliant. And he went to me, you're the club psychologi- psychotherapist, Carl, or psychologist. I went, he said, because you're the first port of call for them players, then you sign posting to people like to me. And it's that intervention 
is the key bit that we have to get right. And that's this is not just in football. This is in, in all workplaces. How does the workplace signpost people to the professionals? Because if we don't have this, it's almost like we've got right now within football, within 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 the workplace, we have the employees, right, which is over here, and we've now got the mental health on this side. There's no bridge, and the bridge is actually the leaders within these organisations, the managers, the general managers, the ex, the executives. We're the bridge for these people to walk across to go and seek help. But at this moment, that we can all see it. But there's not enough people educated enough within the workplace to to guide people to the right in the in the right direction. I'm sure you know, we speak to people in in jobs that people will be so high profile, and I meet people all the time. And by the way, football managers are getting so much better at it, and we're only just ten percent into being the best we can possibly be mm. in guiding our players. I'm embarrassed to say to you, not one player has told me he's in a, he's in a bad place. In 13 years of management, that still means I'm not doing my job correctly. If that makes if that makes sense, and uh, when I've had hamstrings, ties, uh, broken legs, cruciates, bad backs, arm, shoulder injuries, but no one's come to me and said, "Gap, I'm stuck in here." Nobody. I think I think I think you're absolutely right, Carl. Because that's take the words out of my mouth, really. Because you take someone like Gaskell, you know, we need to learn from from that experience and say, <laughs> if we have a talent like that ever again. We will always ensure the support there, but also that then becomes a, a, a magnified glass for society, you know, to say. We've got three or four big players right now who have his talent that the media don't support. And we we live in a world where negative the criticism towards these people becomes a, becomes a positive for their ratings. And we don't care about the mental health of these people. I'm not going to mention, but one of them's very, very close to me, the one I work with. And people, are, I look at like, I don't even know, but Jack Bellis. Like, we have these incredibly gifted footballers that I don't think we're going to direct the gadget, but people are definitely further down that line a bit. I just hope that in the workplaces, we can educate the managers, CEOs, to guide these people in the right direction. Not until we've done that, will we be in a safer place within the workplace? Mm. I, I agree with you totally. I think man management is so, so important. You know, it's a, a critical part of this. And you're right, the manager is, uh, in any organisation, the first port of call. And that's why it's everyone's responsibility to understand mental health and do it a lot better. And I think, I think culturally as well, we need to change, you know, we do PE in schools, we do physical education. Why are we not doing mental health education? It needs to just be part of who we are. It makes up part of who we are as human beings. It's part of our learning process to learn and understand how we think and feel and what impacts and doesn't impact our moods and what we can do for self-care is as important as learning how to play rounders or football or cricket. It's another life skill that we need. And I think fundamentally we need to change the fabric of education from a young age upwards so that we're just naturally understanding of that in part and parcel of our education as human beings and, and our growth. I don't know how you do it though, Sheila. And I think it's a case of, I could have agreeing with you for once. Um, <laughs> it's one of the ones where we have an ability, and, and if I had a criticism of our of my gener generation of education, I wasn't academically involved in in most of my subjects. I've got a fourteen, nearly fifteen year old daughter who's not only involved in probably about eighty percent of her her curriculum, because at a certain age, I think you, you almost know the direction you, you truly want to go down, but the education system sort of keeps you a little bit, I think behind because it's, it's a, you have to do this 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 and this rather than a, a guiding you down one route I, I, the education system has to have a better way i think of supporting this teachers head teachers even if it was only one hour a week a month one hour a month of people having an ability speakers going in talking about their issues educating them laughing about it smiling about it because if you can't because humour is also a very good way of educating young people to make the stigma of this mental health go away. 
and having that ability to smile through a conversation, but equally having the ability to take the conversation into a very, very dot. We do this with Deloitte, Sheila, don't we, where we go through all the different mental health um, arms of it, and then we finish off with, with the suicide aspect of it, where that's the real pinnacle of where it can get to, sadly. Um, mm. Or the lowest of low, sorry, the pinnacle, the lowest of low. And you have to have some sort of ability to converse with groups of people to educate them on on how severe this can be if we don't talk and laugh and communicate. And this and this is something that the education system, I think, needs to look at if we're going to get better at it. Mm. Sorry, my dog's really snoring loudly. I'm not sure if you can hear that. It's not me. <laughs> Sounds like he's got good mental health, though, so, you know, it's all right. Yeah, he's very chilled, very mellow, my dog. I, I, agree, with, I agree with Carl there. I think that's a, such an important point. You know, the education system um, is, you know, one of the first touch points for everyone growing up. I think things are getting better, mm. but um, I think, you know, I'm always of the view, and she has heard me talk about this before, the line's sort of going up. But, it, but it's too linear, you know, for my life. Yeah. We need to be sort of exponential. We need to be cracking the curve because for, when it's too linear, you're, you're, you're losing people, you're losing opportunities, you're, you're yeah. missing out. Um, you know, you put in football in terms of the transfer deadline comes too quickly and you lose, you lose, you miss. And when you're talking about someone's life and their life skills, um, it's often very difficult to then rewire that. You know, it's very difficult to do that reactively. Mm. I think yeah. with mental health, we've seen a massive crest of a wave in terms of awareness, you know, in terms of mm. people even beginning to talk about it a lot more, which is great. I still need to go further. We've seen the education system, the health system, I think, get very good at being reactive to it. Mm -hmm. Where we're still lacking is being preventative oh, with it and, and yeah. actually teaching people to say, you know, when this happens, it will be okay. It's a bit like a footballer putting a, a ball down to take a penalty. You know, if they've had the training and the coaching, which isn't just practicing the penalty technically, but also mentally preparing themselves for it, they're going to have a much higher chance of scoring. If you just give a, pet, a ball to someone and say, off you go, son, try and take that penalty in a big game, you know, it, it's, it's shaky as to whether they're going to put the ball in the back of the net. And we need to prepare people for taking the penalty. That's what we need to do, you know. Yeah. Finish on, because you, you know more than either. What was the worldwide death of COVID-19 in 2020? Ooh, it was uh, it was high, but it still uh, wasn't um, in the, the same region. Yeah, was it, it was, it was 1.2 1. 1. something like that? I think 1.3 million. I think yeah. And what do we call that? What do you used? You used it? Was it a pandemic? And then what's below the pandemic? What was, what was, it, what was an the epidemic and an outbreak? Uh, wasn't it? An outbreak. Yeah, pandemic yeah. epidemic outbreak. People, over a million people took their own life. Please tell me how that's not a pandemic. You're spending millions of million pounds in the government circa of, of taxpayers' money to find a vaccine to make sure we can cure a pandemic, yet people want to make this a worldwide thing and lock us indoors and go through all these issues when there's probably only about 250,000 people less took their own life. Mm. That is still a pandemic, mate. Scary number. Now, and, 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 we, we, and COVID-19 will hopefully two, three years down the line will be something we'll tell our grandkids about and say, remember the day we stayed indoors? Um, someone told me a funny story today saying about imagine when my daughter has kids and, and their kids are 14 say you can't go to that party this week or you're not fair mum let me out of the house you're keeping me inside my daughter can say I was kept inside for near 12 months in 2020 but we are going through a pandemic and the biggest pandemic that we're going to have to suffer from this is people That's taking their own life it absolutely beggar's belief to me, and you can sense in my voice how it sort of infuriates me even more, is that we, we, we're constantly engrossed in negative news circa regarding this. Yet these figures are running almost parallel in the incline, in the graphs. And we don't speak about it as passionately as what we do about COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm not saying COVID-19 shouldn't be spoken about that passionately. I'm just saying that we're only a quarter of a million behind over 12 months. And this could happen. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, Carl. And, you know, uh, I, I'm with you on that. And I've been pretty much campaigning all my life to get much more focus on this and much more illumination. Mm -hmm. And I agree with your passion. And you're right to be irritated. Um, I think, frankly, we should be 
Roy Keane, Alan Shearer about this. We should be sort of going into the government dressing room saying this ain't good enough, you know, um, and we should be uh, quite ferocious in that because this is about people's lives and it is a pandemic. And I actually deliberately, I, uh, uh, I don't just have loads of pictures of Newcastle United legends around my house. I actually got a picture of um, Einstein just before my staircase. I think Sheila's heard the story before. So sorry to bore you with it again, but um, what I do is every day I have to kind of uh, have to come down from the Ronnie O'Sullivan loft. Um, I kind of go through the uh, Liam Gallagher kind of doorway to the Churchill sort of bit, and then I have the, the Einstein bit. Uh, I like to surround myself with legends, as you can see, and um, uh, it's uh, Einstein's definition of insanity, you know, which is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. This is yeah. insane. What we're yeah. doing, it's insane, and um, you know, we we do need to significantly rethink how we're approaching this issue and there is no doubt about it there is no question about it talking being open is is a massive step in the right direction but it's about culture isn't it it's about societal culture yeah it's about a culture of a dressing room could someone in a dressing room say um i'm feeling really depressed mate not just oh you know i've got a bit of a sore thigh and you know well you know i think i've tweaked my hammy gaffer sort of thing it's like no i'm actually do you know what? I, I don't feel like I can play. I feel depressed. I don't feel well. That's the world we need to get to rather than, as we know with mental health, what people do. And, and this is a classic example, you know, in the, in the world, the corporate world, people phone in sick saying, oh, you know, I've got the flu. I'm not feeling well when it's a mental health issue. They don't feel they can say to their manager, to their organisation, I've got a mental health issue. Until we can get rid of that and have the equivalent, for example, in the dressing room where someone comes to the, to the, to the manager and says, I don't think I can play because I'm just feeling depressed and I'm feeling anxious and I'm not feeling well. Until that happens, we're going to struggle to solve it. But the only way you're going to get a player to do that is for them to feel like they're not going to be disadvantaged. They're not going to be looked at differently for doing that. And that's why it's so important to have people like Carl, you know, talking about this because that sends such a ferocious and clear message out to people, which is fantastic. You know, if you're if you're anybody at Oxford United watching this, you know, you, you surely got to think, I've got a manager I could go and talk to about this. You'd hope so anyway. And I think the point you made a few moments ago is so important as well. You know, players who you know, players have quite short careers actually when you think about it. You know, we all sort of work till we're 65 and you know, players that are lucky maybe 35, you know, very few Ryan gigs that's around who can sort of do yoga and get all the way to 40 or whatever it is. But, but the, you know, the, the, the truth of it is that, that then what do they do? You know, because they often don't have an education, uh, they have a training. If you're lucky, you know, not everybody can be Gary Nelson, Gary Nelson and Jamie Carrigan. Not everybody can go into management. Um, what do you do? And, you know, the guy behind me, we know what happened to one of his best friends, Gary Speed. It was too much for him. And, you know, we've got... That's again. That that's that that's insane that we allowed that to happen as a society, mm. as a culture. But we didn't think a bit like a soldier coming back from war. We need to follow these people up. We need to we need to find a culture where this is more open. This is more discussed. And there's no easy answers to any of this. But certainly being open and talking yeah. about it and showing leadership goes a huge way, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I think no, we we have. I think we have an opportunity. Um, I think through June we're about to socially, physically, and in every way, shape, or form, connect once again, hopefully, and everything goes in the way we want it to go. And I think that one of the big key messages over the next few months is to make sure that the conversations around the beer gardens, around mm. the parks, are, are questions that people can ask to make people feel comfortable, to make people feel open and make people feel that they can speak about whatever their woes have been and what good, bad, or indifferent and we have an opportunity right now before people go back into the workplace to sort of educate the bosses to, to put these things in place for when their people comes back into the workplace on mm. how we can have these conversations moving forward. This is, we're in a too, weirdly, we, we only have, strangely, we only have a very short period of time to make sure the next step of the mental health story is actually a good one because we're about to have that social and physical interaction again very shortly. And these are very, very key moments. It's almost like you meet someone for the first time, first impressions are important. Well, this is going to be the same for the conversations that bosses and 
and certain people are going to have in the next mm. of June, July and August. And we have a real good opportunity to get it right. And Julia, you're right what you're saying because... I'm going to be in trouble if I don't get to the training ground. We've got a game. We're playing top of the, <laughs> playing to top of the league tonight. <laughs> well, look, well, if I may say, just Sheila, just before we close, I mean, yeah. you know, I think uh, it's fantastic what, what Carl's doing. Genuinely, I think uh, being this open and this up front is, is brilliant. And uh, I really, really commend it. And um, I really hope actually other people, uh, particularly in football, see this and um, take note and think about how they're doing with their teams and, also, more broadly, other industries, because this is about man management. You know, it is that Sir Bobby Robson philosophy. You've got to want to passionately care about the person you're managing to get the absolute best out of them. And you can always get the best out of someone if you're willing to do it. And that does mean looking at the mental health aspects, as well as all the other aspects of performance, which are critical, of course. I think what I'd also say is, um, you know, um, Mike Ashley, if you're watching, if you, if you think Steve, you know, he's had his time... Get Carl in, because, oh, uh, no, you know... No. I, know big, uh, I know you don't like Steve, but I, I know Bruce, you're one of my best mates there, so I, I'm reserved on that. Mike Astley was trying to buy Oxford at one stage, so just keep him away from Oxford for me, please. Yeah, yeah, Mike, don't do that, mate. It's, uh, yeah. it's, not, it's not helpful, you know. Listen, it's a real pleasure to meet you, mate, and like I say, hopefully our paths will cross um, later on down the line somewhere, and I know you're very, very busy at this moment in time, so I think, I think from all of us, though, I think, like, not just for mental health, but thank you for all your hard work and what you're going through at this moment in time because mm. I mean, there's so many unsung heroes going unnoticed for the, the dedication, the work ethic. We all have a moan about your mate, about how wrong the government's doing this and how wrong the government's doing that. But I'm sure as a whole, we're all very, very lucky to be British citizens in this moment in time and we're seen to be leading the way right across the world. And for people like yourself and the government, government who are working incredibly hard doing that. So... Thank you for that as well, mate. Yeah. Oh, I really appreciate it. And, um, at some point, I'd love to come down to Oxford and uh, see how you're training. And um, I'll even be brave enough to take a penalty. I'll, uh, I'll come down, I'll, I'll prepare myself <laughs> and try, uh, try, try, try and sort of uh, recreate a bit of Shearer, you know. <laughs> take care, All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.